he was slapping the, the guy like in the head. And I said, well, you know that's illegal. And he said, uh, well, get out of here. Mind your own business, nigga. They slammed me against the wall and they had my hands behind my back. And he slapped me over my head with that uh, flashlight they have. They was hitting me in the back of my head with a walkie-talkie, a black jack, and the back of their gun handles. She hit me like on the side of the face, and she hit him like in the back of the head. And he waved through his other head and he said, come here, smart ass. And when I walked up to him, he whacked me with the pistol. One police officer had their feet on my back, holding me down while all the police officers was kicking me in my face. So he put it between his legs, and took it out, cocked it put it up on my neck and said, I'll shoot you in the head. It makes you feel like if you're walking on the street, you could get attacked by a police officer at any time for any reason. And they can make up their own reasons. And the court's going to believe them because they're police officers. Almost everybody I know have been harassed or beaten or you know slapped around or just mistreated by the police. of Chicago, there has been a systematic violation of the human rights of African Americans who have been subjected to some of the most indignant conduct that any human being can visit upon another. We have assembled the car. We are making a statement that when one individual, be he black or white, makes a determination to abuse the rights of another that there are men and women of conscience in this town who will come forward and stand up and say, we will not tolerate that type of barbarity. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. I've never felt that the police were part of a process of justice. I've always felt the police would be part of a process of injustice, of messing on you, and of repressing you. And I don't know any black man, Puerto Rican man, any man of color raised in this city who wouldn't feel the same way. I don't know any who haven't been stopped one time or another, harassed. And, you know, and then you're in that minute where suddenly this guy has the power of life and death over you. hit me in the mouth with his flashlight. Then uh, he handcuffed me and hit me a couple of more times in the mouth. And then put me in the car and drove around beating me a little bit. And then when we got to the police station, he took me out and threw me on the ground and put his gun to my head and said that if I told anybody that he'd done that, that he was gonna kill me and that he knew where I lived. In the days of slavery, they say you beat one slave, you keep a hundred in, in check. And that's pretty much, the, the, it looks like the avenue they're following. If you, if you kill one person uh, that's standing out on the street or what have you, then others say, well, we're not going to stand out there because we see what the police are doing. He had the gun in his hand. He was swinging it, and it hit me in the side of my head as I turned duck and I fell back against the wall. When I fell back against the wall, he kept coming towards me, hit me in my face with the gun in my mouth and everything. If my friends weren't there, I think he would have killed me. I am not sure that in this country, black life is always 
understood as being a valuable life. It appears from inside the black community that a white police officer that's willing to crack some black folks' heads is a hero, is a hero, because he's protecting the streets and he's keeping them in place. Until Rodney King appeared in everybody's living room on their own television set, so many people didn't even believe that this happened, you know, that there really was such a thing as police brutality until it happened to them or their son or their daughter or their husband or wife. And now it seems to me it's a time that people have to admit, whether they wanted to or not, that these things happen. Rodney King was not an isolated incident. I think those people who had not been sheltered were not shocked or amazed, were not phased. They understand that this goes on constantly. That, okay, Rodney King, yeah, what about my sister? What about my brother yesterday? <laughs> The sergeant reached into the car and I said, I'm getting out. And he grabbed me by my hair. And when he was pulling me out, he punched me in the face. The police opened the door, grabbed the boy out, threw him to the ground. And I saw one of them had his feet on his head doing this here. Then they flipped me over and put the handcuffs on. And then all the next thing I know, almost every police car that had pulled up was kicking me in my face. Almost all of the victims of police brutality are black and Latin. So we have always tried to show the connection between the racist attitudes in society, the racist attitudes in the police department, and the existence, tolerance, and policy of police brutality in Chicago. When I walked up to these hit me with the pistol across my face right here. I went back, hit the pole, and I fell face first, you know, the floor on the ground. And he lifted me up from there, threw me against the tree, grabbed me, threw me against the fender of the car, kept hitting my face on you know, the fender of the car. He made me bleed, he busted up my ribs. He started beating me up you know, by the van and the car, so my friends couldn't see what he was doing to me. It's just like, you say a wrong word, and right away, boom, they hit you with a knife stick, they hit you with a flashlight. Uh, scary, that's all, it's scary. Good evening, Chicago police at this moment are scouring the city, trying to hunt down three suspects who are believed to be responsible for shooting two Chicago policemen this afternoon. One of the policemen is dead. The other is now the shooting, in critical condition. Police detectives swarmed the scene at 81st and Morgan. At all points, bulletin was issued for two black gunmen driving a late model brown Chevrolet Impala. Here's what's new tonight. Both Chicago policemen are dead. Three young men are being questioned as suspects in Chicago that police killing. tonight are stepping up what is already one of the most massive manhunts in the history of the city. They are now searching every block the of the city. The police department is coming under a heavy attack tonight for the way it's handling the investigation. Several people have accused the police of roughing out potential suspects and of breaking into homes to look After for one suspects. one of the most intensive manhunts in Chicago history, Chicago police are now holding two men. Andrew Wilson, two age 29. Star. His brother Jackie, 21. They are behind bars tonight after one of the largest police manhunts in Chicago Wilson history. Wilson appeared today in the holiday court. Andrew wore a bandage on his head. Prosecutors listed the Wilson criminal records. On February 15, 1982, I was called by the attending physician who was working at CIRMEC Health Service to report that a Mr. Andrew Wilson had been arrested, brought into the jail, and had evidence of unusual injuries on his face, chest, and legs. I examined him quickly and was able to identify multiple very unusual injuries that we have never seen here in the at CIRMAC Health Services. I went down and picked up the case because it was my regular assignment to do so. And I met Andrew Wilson, who at the time was bandaged up. We went through the normal court procedures. I went in the back and spoke to him, uh, and he described to me the injuries that he had. I then called our investigator to uh, come over with a camera to take pictures of those injuries. He had a slash over his eye, which was a, a wound that had been previously um, sutured and had been split open again. He had a split on the back of his head, which had been sutured. Uh, that he described as coming from getting hit on the head with a uh, 45 by the uh, wagon uh, police officers. He had all sorts of marks on his legs. He had marks on his chest. And the most interesting were the marks on his ears. 
but they were little tiny loop marks on his ears. Um, that I'd never encountered before. They was beating on me. They was kicking at me. They was punching me. And one time they knocked me down. Somebody grabbed a bag out of the garbage can, a plastic bag out of the garbage can. He stuck it over my head and he had his hand on it, right? And I could hardly breathe. I was like suffocating. And so I was struggling when they were still hitting on me. So I bit a hole through the bag. Bird said, it's fun time. He took out the black box out of the bag. He put one wire on one ear and one wire on the other ear. So he started cranking it. I was hollering and stuff and I, I would rub it off. They stretched me across the heat radiator and handcuffed me. He put the wire on my fingers, my baby fingers, one on one finger and one on the other finger. And then he kept cranking it and kept cranking it and kept cranking it. And I was hollering and screaming. I was calling for help and stuff. My teeth was grinding, flickering in my head, pain and all that stuff. He kept cranking and cranking and cranking it. He kept on doing it over and over and over. It hurts but it stays in your head, okay? It stays in your head, and it grinds your teeth. It grinds constantly, grinds constantly. The pain just stays in your head. Burge asked me, was I going to make a statement, or was he going to torture me some more? And I told him I would make a statement. I signed anything they gave me because I didn't want to be tortured anymore. Burge said, we're going to fry your black ass now because of the statement I gave him. I discovered, looking at the photographs and reading through Wilson's deposition and court testimony, that in fact he had been tortured at Area 2 uh, Police Headquarters, that uh, the claims that he made uh, could be verified by the photographs, that is, that he had been held against a hot radiator and burned, that he'd had electrodes attached to his ears and been given electric shocks, and that he had been uh, beaten. In addition to these marks on his ears, what is the other evidence we have that this is electric shock? Well, first there's his story of how they did this to him, that they attached wires with the electrodes to his ears, the clips to his ears, and he stated they had a black box, and the wires came from this black box, and they turned the handle of the black box and generated the electricity that way. The black box, as described by Andrew Wilson, was a phone generator, uh, one of those field uh, telephones that uh, uh, can generate its own electricity uh, that they, the military uh, used in Vietnam. And it has a handle, and then there's the generator, and there were black wires that were attached to the generator and alligator clips attached to the wires. So therefore, you could crank the generator and send about 90 to 100 volts of electricity through the wires into the alligator clips, which you could, of course, attach to the ears and the fingers or wherever else you could attach it. And this is what they did on several occasions to Andrew Wilson. And that's what I said what was so impressive was that everything he described was absolutely mm -hmm. consistent. And again, it was his recognition that they'd gone beyond the bounds, that hitting and kicking is quote, acceptable and acceptable, right? right? Yeah. That's the usual type of thing. But this had clearly gone beyond the the boundary of what was permissible uh, in terms of extracting a confession, if you will. And his appropriate response, his description of what happened to him, the physical evidence all is diagnostic of uh, him having been uh, tortured with electric shock. Wilson was prosecuted, of course, for the, for the murders of the police officers. It was a very celebrated case. He was convicted of the double murder and given the death sentence. He then appealed to the Illinois Supreme Court um, based primarily on the fact that his confession was tortured out of him and shouldn't have been admitted at trial. The Illinois Supreme Court, in an unprecedented decision, agreed that the evidence of all this torture was so strong that the confession had to be barred from evidence and gave him a new trial, set aside his death penalty. For the most part, using sufficient and sophisticated torture techniques, you can get most people to agree to anything uh, if you torture them long enough or in a sophisticated way. Evidence that's gotten from somebody from beating them up is not reliable. 
you don't know why a person makes those statements. It could be because it's true, but it could also be because they just have a low tolerance for pain. Clearly the intent at that point has to be to terrify, to punish. At some point it might be to extract a confession, but it's very unlikely that at that point there's any effort in listening to what a person has to say. When you want to listen to what a person has to say, you don't start by terrifying them. Uh, so that it really is all about punishment and revenge and excessive use of power. For all practical purposes, when a man gets into my custody, uh, custody, he's already subdued. There's no way to justify handcuff injuries, cracks across the head, if he's sitting in an interview room surrounded by a police officer. So when I am allowed to use terror, uh, terrorist tactics, illegal tactics, illegal instruments to coerce confessions out of people, I have just damaged the whole fabric of confidence the whole fabric of the spirit of the law, if not the letter of the law. Uh, at that point, we knew of only one other instance of, uh, of torture that had been alleged against Burge. But uh, during the trial, while Burge, or just after Burge testified, I got a commu an anonymous communication uh, that was clearly from uh, someone who worked with Burge who told me that in fact there was another victim, Melvin Jones, and said he was in the county jail and that we should go see him and check it out. He had testified in his own criminal case seven years before that he'd been tortured in a very similar way by Burge as Andrew Wilson had. We got Melvin Jones' testimony there were other victims named in that testimony, and that is what started the ball rolling. But as we then contacted other lawyers, all of a sudden it was like um, there were all these cases of torture out there, each kept in their individual little compartment. And no one had ever coordinated the effort to get a history of this kind of abuse uh, from an individual police officer or Area 2. I mean, everybody knew it. It was standard operating procedure. Uh, old former state attorneys who were defense attorneys, they knew what happened in Area 2. Old police officers became a defense attorneys. They knew that there was a pattern of it. Uh, all the old time pals knew about it. But nobody ever really coordinated an effort to try to suggest to a court that there was a pattern. As one detective told me, uh, they were still doing that kind of thing at Area 2 long after they stopped it at other, in other uh, detective headquarters in the city. Why would it continue to Area 2? I think that we can attribute it to the commander of Area 2 headquarters, John Burge. Before joining the police department, John Burge was a military policeman in Vietnam. Although he denies this, units like his were involved interrogating Viet Cong prisoners and that they used the same type of electronic device or Tucker telephone that John Burge and other detectives in Chicago used on black suspects. As a Chicago police officer, John Burge was repeatedly accused of torture from Russian roulette, the black box, and other types of, of beatings for 12 years. During that time, he rose from detective to sergeant to lieutenant to commander. He handcuffed me real tight, as I said, and he cut my circulation off. He went out of the room and stayed, I guess, for about an hour. And he came back and tried to talk to him, asked me what could I tell him, you know, about the robbery. I told him I couldn't tell you anything about the robbery. I don't know about what you're talking about. And he said then that, oh, you're going to play tough. So you will tell us before you leave here when we want to know. So I've been known to get out of people's what I want. And then he uh, went back out and got a little friend. This is when he said, he said, oh, and his little friend came in and said, oh, it's fun time, huh? He said, yep. And he played Russian roulette with me, first of all, with a big 44 Magnum. He took that out and took all the bullets out of it. And you know, you'll see him play Russian rule and spin it around and put it to my head and snapped it. Click two or three times. He got real upset and said, you will talk, you black and You said, I'll, I'll make you talk or kill you and him one. So I still don't say So he, in anger, he rushed to the typewriter and grabbed the uh, plastic cover off there and just crammed it down over my head. And, and it's like he was a madman. This other little officer helped me because I was trying to get my uh, arms out from behind the chair, but I couldn't do anything. And I passed out. And like I said, he gave me a breath of air. And I came to conscious. He 
you ready to talk? And I said, I don't have anything to tell you still. So he'd do it again. The third time, out of the third time, that's when I told him, I said, I'll tell you whatever you want to know, man. Just don't do this no more. But he went out and got a piece of paper and came back and told me, if you sign this, and I looked at it, and he said, well, if you don't sign it, you know what you said, we're going to take you back. You're going to tell us before we leave, but we want to know. It was a confession where I said that I did this or that, and I didn't say no such thing, you know, but it wrote up in his own words. What something they had, how they write out things, but it wrote up in his own words, right? I signed it. Just stopped the torture. That's the only reason why I signed it. Burge beat me. He pulled out an electric box and shocked me on my testicles with the two prongs on it. Burge said he would blow my head off if I told him. Burge was in the room when they tried to get me to confess. They put plastic bags over my head. I passed out three times. Burge cut the wires from the black box to my handcuffs. The shock knocked me across the floor. My jaws clenched and teeth ground from the pain. handcuffed to the wall when Burge came into the room. He said it's fun time again. He showed me a wooden box with two wires attached. He said, this is what we got for niggas like you. He shot Burge. He pointed the gun at me and pulled the trigger, but the chamber was empty. Then they put a rope around my neck, like a noose. It cut up my throat. They beat me for a while. My hands down and shot my balls. It made me bite my tongue and blood came out of my mouth. Birds told me that if I didn't talk, I wish I'd never set eyes on him. He's been hand cut down my hands. pants. Shot me on my foot, my thighs, and my penis. When I still didn't talk, Birds pointed a gun at my head. He cocked it and said, I'm going to blow your black head off. The result of the Andrew Wilson trials was the jury finding a de facto policy and practice of torture and abuse by Chicago police officers against persons suspected of killing or injuring a police officer. The jury, from which all blacks had been excluded, refused to award damages to Andrew Wilson. And so what we wanted to say was, what does this mean? What does it mean that a torturer has risen to the ranks of commander and now is being supported by the city of Chicago and by the court system as a whole? And so we said, we can't just sit silently by. And so what did we do? We took it to the streets. The purpose of the task force uh, has been to take to the public the issue of police brutality, specifically the case of police torture involving John Burge and his many victims. We also felt that if this was condoned, then certainly the garden variety, everyday street beat-ups would certainly be condoned as well. And I think the activities we've done have been to educate people about the existence of torture by police in Chicago and then to try to build a militant uh, uh, position around that, uh, a position of confrontation with city council, with the mayor, uh, at city hall. Um, and a position that required them to deal with it. We had prevailed upon some people in the city council to um, bring a motion before the city council calling for a, a real city investigation into the allegations against John Burge since the uh, civil suits had not settled the question at all. On the council, Alderman Ed Burke had paid out upwards of a million dollars in city money for lawyers to defend Burge and he was killing the motion in his finance committee, so we decided that the only way to get any action would be to interrupt the city council meeting and shout at them about Burge and about police torture. I think it's important for the community to organize, to educate, to agitate, to do things like get John Burgess off the force.